Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief Test Webcast Series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Geography Update Series and is titled Hong Kong SAR Budget 2024-25 Commentary. My name is Polly Wen and I am a tax partner based in Deloitte, China. I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. I have two speakers with me today. They are Roy Fang and Doris Chick. They are both based in Deloitte, China. You may access our bios on the left side of the screen. Before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of our webcast console in case you are new to us. First, all users are on listen-only mode. If you have any content-related questions, you can submit it at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the screen. We will do our best to respond to your questions during the presentation. Second, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at your convenience during the webcast. You may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. If you want to download today's slides and the related publications, please go to the Downloads and Links box. On the other hand, mobile device users can view the slides and answer the survey on screen. Third, if you require an attendance record for this event, you will receive an automated email with CPE certificate after watching it for 15 minutes. Hey, next slide, please. Today's webcast is about the budget of Hong Kong SAR announced by our financial secretary two weeks ago. In the following hour, we shall give you a highlight of this budget, including the key proposed changes in the salaries tax and profits tax regime, stamp duty, as well as some changes in levies in Hong Kong that you may wish to know. Then, Roy, Roy will share with you some stimulus for financial service sector to enhance Hong Kong's position as an international finance and asset management center. Lastly, Doris will give you an update on various important development in Hong Kong tax regime, such as Pillar 2 implementation timetable, patent pox regime, as the redomicilation to Hong Kong. We will have a Q&A section at the end. Now, let's start our sharing today. Hong Kong adopts a financial year-end of March 31st. In this budget, our financial secretary provides an update estimate of the government's result for the year ending March 2024 and forecasts the result for the coming years. For the fiscal year ending March 24, it is estimated that Hong Kong will be suffer from an operating deficit of 92.4 billion Hong Kong dollar. The consolidated deficit after proceeds from bond insurance net of repayment is estimated to be close to 101.6 billion Hong Kong dollar. This is the second year that Hong Kong recorded more than 100 billion Hong Kong dollar deficit. This amount was much higher than the original estimate made by the financial secretary at last year which was mainly caused by the drop in government revenue. Major revenue of Hong Kong comes from income taxes, salaries tax, stamp duty from transfer of properties and shares, as well as land sales. And land sales used to be one of the major revenue contributors to Hong Kong. At last year, the financial secretary estimated that land sales could bring 850 billion Hong Kong dollar revenue to the government. However, the government announced a temporary suspension of land sales program in the beginning of 24. This led to the major shortfall of revenue in this year. Stamp duty also dropped a bit. Hong Kong imposed stamp duty on transfer of shares and properties. As the value as well as the volume of transactions are uh, much less than the original estimate, the stamp duty revenue also decreased. To encourage more shared transactions, the budget introduced a stamp duty exemption on transfer of REIT units. Roy will give you more details later. 
And for property transactions, Hong Kong is one of the most expensive cities in the world in terms of property price. In order to curb the ever-increasing property price, the Hong Kong government introduced special measures on stamp duty years ago. Over the years, the Hong Kong government adjusts the intensity of these special measures according to the market situation. In this budget, the financial secretary announced the cancellation of such special measures. Right after the cancellation, the number of property transactions increased significantly. I shall give you more details in the next session. As for profits tax and salaries tax, the revenue is relatively stable according to the statistics. The financial secretary forecasts that Hong Kong will continue to have a deficit budget for the next fiscal year ending 24-25. With the continuous effort of the government, Hong Kong is expected to resume to a break-even position in the year after and with a steady growth afterwards. The Hong Kong government believes that the key to boosting public revenue lies in sustained high-quality economic development. By growing the economic pie and enabling the economy to grow in a robust and diversified manner, the revenue will increase. And to achieve this, the financial secretary outlined various policies to promote the economic development in order to attract more investments and revenue, which Roy and Doris will share later. Regarding how to increase revenue, the Hong Kong government avoid taking any um, uh, certain actions that may affect local economic recovery and people's livelihood. Hong Kong has a simple tax system and low tax rate. As said, the major taxes are income tax, salaries tax, uh, and stamp duty. We don't have sales tax. This is one of the most competitive edge of Hong Kong to attract more, uh, foreign investors. But there are also increasing voices in the market that the Hong Kong government should revisit the tax regime and study the need to expand the tax base. But our financial secretary emphasized the importance of the simple and low tax regime. He also confirmed that there is no plan to introduce sales tax at this moment. Having considered the above factors, the government adopted the affordable users pay principle so as to increase revenue without affecting the general public. For example, a minor amendment to the salaries tax introduced progressive rating system and hotel accommodation tax. I will share with you details later. At the same time, the government will continue the growth of government expenditure to maintain a healthy uh, fiscal results. Hong Kong will continue to issue government bonds in the coming years. The financial secretary emphasized, the, emphasized that the proceeds from bond insurance will not be used for funding recurring expenditure. And Hong Kong will adhere to the fiscal discipline of keeping expenditure at a prudent level within the limits of revenue. The issuance of bond, government bonds is favorable for the development of bond market and allows the use of capital raised from the market to drive green and sustainable and infrastructure projects. Indeed, it is the goal of Hong Kong government to transform Hong Kong into a leading fundraising platform for green capital and green programs. At last fiscal year, the Hong Kong government issued the first triple currency green bond, which was the largest ESG bond insurance in Asia. In this fiscal year, February 24, the Hong Kong government also issued a digitalized green bond in four currencies. This demonstrates Hong Kong's strength and leadership position in combining the bond market, green and sustainable finance, as well as fintech, and demonstrate Hong Kong's government's determination to become a premier center for green and sustainable finance. Hi, please. GDP growth in real term is forecast to range from 2.5% to 3.5% in the year 24. From 2025 to 27, the trend growth rate of, econom of economy in real term is assumed to be 3.2% per annum. As for the GDP deflator, 
measuring overall price change in the economy is forecast to increase by 2.7 percent in 24 and 2.5 percent from 25 to 27 to 28. Next slide, please. Although it is expected that Hong Kong will incur deficit, this year's budget continues to provide various relief measures to the general public and corporates. For individuals, there is a 100% salary tax deduction, capped at 3,000 Hong Kong dollars. But at the same time, the Hong Kong government proposed to increase the salary tax rate for high-earning individuals. In Hong Kong, Employment income is subject to salaries tax either at progressive rate from 2% to 17% or a standard rate of 15%, whichever lower. The high earning individuals generally tax at a standard rate of 15%. If an individual also earns profits tax from its sole proprietary uh, business or property income, he or she can select to tax under personal assessment if it can reduce their overall tax liabilities. In this budget, it is proposed to implement a two-tier standard rate regime for salaries tax and tax under personal assessment from 2024 to 25. That is the coming 1st of April 24. For taxpayer whose net income exceeds 5 million Hong Kong dollar and whose salary tax is taxed under personal assessment and charged at standard rate, the first five million Hong Kong dollar of their net income will be subject to the tax standard tax rate of 15%, and the portion exceeding the five million will be taxed at the new uh, tax rate of 16%. Based on the government statistics, the new regime would only affect 12,000 taxpayer or just 0.6% of the taxpayer. In fact, Hong Kong has not adjusted its salary tax rate for many, many years. Although the tax rate increase, the increment is minimal and only affect high earn, uh, a few high income earners. And it is still at a very low side compared to many other jurisdictions. On corporate side, there is also a 100% profit tax reduction kept at 3,000 Hong Kong dollars. In this budget, the financial secretary also proposed to relax tax deduction on certain items. It includes the removing of deduction cap on certain capital expenditure, like those incurred in acquiring industrial buildings or commercial buildings, as well as allowing deduction of reinstatement costs after expiry of tenancy agreement, which was currently not, not deductible. Doris will give you more details later. Next slide, please. As I just said, the government committed to maintain the simple tax system and low tax rate in Hong Kong. In order to increase the revenue, the government introduced various measures in this budget. They are not regular tests, but some levies or charges. I quote two of them here. First, it is the progressive rating system. At present, property owners in Hong Kong are liable to raise at 5% of the annual rateable value of the property. Rateable value is an estimated annual rental value of a property as a designated valuation reference date, assuming that the property was then vacant and to let out with certain adjustments like cost of repairs and maintenance. Under the new progressive rating system, properties with higher rateable value will be subject to a higher rate up to 12% starting from the 1st of January uh, 25. In this new system, only properties with annual rateable value higher than 550,000 Hong Kong dollar per year or 70,000 US dollar per year would be affected. It is expected that this new system would only affect 2% of the properties in Hong Kong. The financial secretary also resumed the collection of hotel accommodation tax at a flat rate of 3%. This will be effective from the 1st of January uh, 25. The hotel accommodation tax is considered as minimal compared to other jurisdictions which generally has sales tax or other similar mandatory service charge. 
At the same time, the Hong Kong government plans to upgrade tourism infrastructure and service to attract more high spending overnight visitors to Hong Kong. Next slide, please. Now here come the most debatable and long-awaited cancellation of the special stamp duty measures on transfer of residential properties in Hong Kong. A little background. Transfer of Hong Kong properties are subject to stamp duty in Hong Kong. The property price in Hong Kong is one of the top in the world. To manage the ever-increasing property price, which may affect the livelihood of the general public, the Hong Kong government introduced several rounds of special stamp duty measures on transfer of residential properties. They are officially named the Mang Sai Management Measures, or if you read the newspaper in Hong Kong, it is generally called Harsh Measures on Stamp Duty. The Harsh Measures consist of three items. It's Special Stamp Duty, SSD, which is tax on the seller, uh, Buyer Stamp Duty, BSD, and new residential stamp duty, NRSD. BSD and NRSD are taxed on a buyer. In Hong Kong, individuals derive gain on disposal of property is generally not taxable in Hong Kong unless he is engaged in property speculation. It is believed to be one of the reasons of the rising property price in Hong Kong. To curb the short-term speculation activities, the government introduced special stamp duty SSD many years ago. If the, property, if the residential property is being sold shortly after the acquisition, SSD will be imposed. Depends on the length of ownership and um, the SSD range, range from 10% to 20% on the consideration of the property, irrespective whether the disposal is at gain or loss. SSD is removed in this budget. BSD and NRSD are applicable to buy a side. The normal stamp duty rate for Hong Kong individual residents in buying residential properties in Hong Kong range from a fixed sum of Hong Kong dollar 100 or 4.25% of the property value. If a non-Hong Kong resident or a company acquire residential property in Hong Kong, the applicable stamp duty rate would be 7.5%, which is much higher. It is called a BSD. If a Hong Kong resident already own a residential property in Hong Kong and buy another property here, he or she will also liable to the highest stamp duty rate, uh, the NRSD, at 7.5%. In this budget, the financial secretary announced the cancellation of BSD and NRSD. It means that or Hong Kong or non-Hong Kong resident, or uh, if there is a company acquired a residential property in Hong Kong, the stamp duty rate would be the same. The removal of these harsh measures revitalized the residential property market in Hong Kong, and it is expected that more property transactions will bring, bring more revenue to the government. Now, um, we have a polling question here. Uh, I guess some of the audience may not be Hong, may be from other Asia Pacific region. I would like to know uh, what would you suggest the Hong Kong government to increase the revenues? And you have four options here. The first one, increase the profits tax rate and salaries tax rate. Second, increase the stamp duty on transfer of properties. The third, expand the tax base by introducing sales tax or the last option increase or relaunch various duties such as betting duty or estate duty. How Hong Kong should expand the test base is a long debated topic uh, because it can bring stable recurring revenue to the government, uh, but it also increased the burden of the general public and increased the compliance burden of companies carrying out the business in Hong Kong. So um, it seems that most of the audience suggests that the government should not affect the profits tax and salaries tax rate, and they would rather uh, for the government to consider the, uh, in the relaunch of special duties. Okay, thank you for your participation. And now let me pass the time to Rod.
Uh, thank you, Polly. So uh, here, let us go through the key task-related measures that the budget proposed uh, with an aim to enhance Hong Kong's competitive advantage as an international financial center, and in particular, as an asset and wealth management hub in the region. Asset and wealth management is one of the key pillars for Hong Kong. Based on the budget, the assets under management in Hong Kong is more than 30 trillion Hong Kong dollar. And Hong Kong is Asia's largest hedge fund center and the second largest center for private equity management after mainland China. Since a few years ago, the Hong Kong government has launched the Open End Fund Company, OFC regime, and the Limited Partnership Fund regime, LPF regime, with an aim to attract more fund vehicles to be established in Hong Kong. These regimes are welcomed by the market and currently there are more than 250 OFCs and 780 LPF registered in Hong Kong. Particularly for OFC, we do see more and more OFC set up in Hong Kong in the last two or three years, which is mainly due to the government's grant scheme, which provides subsidy on 70% of the fees incurred on the setup of an OFC fund, subject to the cap of Hong Kong dollar 1 million per fund. The grant scheme also provides subsidies on 70% of expenses incurred on the setup of real estate investment trust REIT in Hong Kong, but subject to a higher cap of Hong Kong dollar 8 million per REIT. While the grant scheme would originally end in May this year, the financial secretary has announced in the budget that in order to drive market development, the Hong Kong government will extend the grant scheme for OFC and REIT for three years thus uh, until mid-2027, while well, more details are expected to be released by the government soon. Besides, it's worthwhile to note that for the uh, Capital Investment Entrance Scheme, CIES, uh, which was launched in early March, applicants under CIES regime is allowed it to invest in private, privately issued um, OFC or LPF, uh, which would be the good news for OFC and uh, LPF to attract more investors. Apart from that, the budget has also proposed measures to enhance the preferential tax regime for funds, single family offices, and carry interests. Here, as a recap, Hong Kong has launched a tax exemption regime for funds, which we normally refer to as a unified fund exemption, UFE, back in 2019. The Unified Fund Exemption Regime provides Hong Kong tax, profits tax exemptions on qualified transactions carried out by funds, including onshore funds and offshore funds, that are managed in Hong Kong, provided certain conditions are met. In May last year, 2023, the Hong Kong government has also launched a tax exemption regime for single family offices, which provide Hong Kong profits tax exemption for family owned investment holding vehicles managed by single family office in Hong Kong. Similar to the unified fund exemption regime, the tax concession regime for single family offices will apply to income derived from qualifying transactions, provided other conditions such as a minimum AUM of 240 million Hong Kong dollar are fulfilled. Besides, there are Hong Kong profits tax and salaries tax exemptions on eligible carry interest arising from private equity related transactions uh, uh, paying out by a fund provided certain conditions are fulfilled. In the budget, the financial secretary announced that the government will en enhance this preferential tax regime by reviewing the scope of the regime, increasing the type of qualifying transactions and enhancing the feasibility handling the incidental income issue. Next slide, please. Here is a list of the uh, qualifying transactions that will be eligible for tax exemptions under the unified fund exemption as well as under the single family office uh, regime. So if we quickly go through the list, um, the list of qualifying transactions include securities, basically uh, referring to listed stock, uh, listed bonds, etc. Uh, it also includes uh, shares, uh, bonds, debentures uh, or notes issued by a private company. 
uh, include it, it include future contracts, foreign exchange contract, uh, certificates of deposit, exchange traded commodities, uh, foreign currency, OTC derivative product, um, etc. So basically, uh, if we uh, if you go through the list, you will be uh, noted that they, uh, the list uh, comprise financial products in the secondary market uh, or private equity investments. Um, however, uh, we do see like funds or family offices uh, in recent years are, 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 are more keen to invest in other type of assets or other asset class. For example, uh, digital assets such as uh, cryptos uh, or family offices uh, may be investing in art pieces, wines, etc. So um, um, it would be good to see that the government is now considering to um, expand the list of qualifying transactions. Uh, and uh, although details will be uh, announced later, um, we, 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 we hope that the government will do a um, consultation with the industry uh, to make sure that the list uh, of qualifying transactions would be um, uh, uh, expanded in a way that could cater for the um, uh, asset class that uh, funds or, or single family offices uh, are, are keen to invest into, such as uh, digital asset, RPs, etc. Next slide, please. The second area that um, has always been an issue under the fund exemption regime, as well as under the uh, single family office tax exemption regime, is the incidental income issue. Okay. So under both regime, uh, income derived from uh, transaction in qualifying asset, for example, buying and selling uh, listed stock, listed bonds, uh, or OTC derivative, etc., would be exempt from Hong Kong profits tax. However, income derived from holding of this asset, uh, for example, dividend income uh, derived from holding of uh, listed equities, uh, or interest income derived from the holding of uh, 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 of bonds. They are considered as incidental income, okay? And um, for incidental incomes, uh, they are subject to a 5% rule or 5% threshold. Um, basically, the formula would be as follows. Um, for a particular year of assessment, uh, we need to calculate whether the total trading receipts from incidental transaction, which basically means like interest income, dividend income derived from those uh, investments, would be more than 5% uh, of the total trading receipt from uh, qualifying transaction and incidental transaction for those uh, investments, okay? So if uh, it's more than 5%, then that means for that particular year of assessment, um, basically um, incidental income, including like interest income, dividend would not be tax exempt under the fund exemption regime, as well as under the uh, single family office uh, exemption regime. Uh, and uh, may be subject to, and they may be subject to profits tax in Hong Kong under the general charging se session, uh, which would be looking at whether those income is Hong Kong source versus offshore uh, source, etc. So it means that um, under the current uh, tax exemption regime for funds and single family offices, uh, this regime may not be that favorable for debt fund or credit credit funds or for single family offices that invest in a large fixed income portfolio. Um, the industry uh, has been lobbying against this 5% threshold or 5% restrictions uh, to the Hong Kong government. We are happy to see that uh, the financial secretary has announced it in the budget that they would be uh, looking to enhance the flexibility in handling this 5% um, uh, threshold uh, restriction. Uh, next slide, please. Apart from the measures in relation to asset management or wealth management sector, uh, there are also certain measures uh, to boost the securities markets in Hong Kong. For example, uh, to further enhance the market competitiveness, stamp duty payable on the transfer of real estate investment trust REITs uh, will be waived. Besides, uh, stamp duty payable on the dropping business of option market maker uh, which includes uh, stamp duty in relation to the hedging activities carried out by option market maker uh, will be waived. Next slide, please. 
So now uh, I, I will pass the time to Doris to um, cover the um, other tests related measures uh, announced in the budget. Hey, thanks, Roy. Um, let me talk about uh, other measures that are related to the long term economic development. Um, first of all, is to review the tax incentive for maritime services um, to support the um, sustainable development of Hong Kong's maritime and port industry. Uh, Hong Kong will further enhance the tax concession regime for the shipping industry. Indeed, Hong Kong has already developed a favorable tax concession regime for the maritime industry over the last few years. Uh, it already covered a variety of shipping related businesses. Uh, as a recap, uh, ship lessors can get a tax exemption uh, that is 0% tax rate if certain conditions are met. And ship leasing managers may also get tax exemption for services provided to associated um, ship lessors. And if the ship leasing management services are provided to unrelated ship lessors, the profit tax rate is reduced by half, that is 8.25%. Um, for ma uh, marine insurance related business, um, the profit tax rate is reduced by half, that is 8.25%. And the tax concession was further extended to um, ship agents, ship managers, and ship brokers if their qualifying activities are carried out um, for a ship lessor or a leasing manager who can enjoy the, um, the, the concessionary tax rates that I, I just mentioned. Those ship uh, agents, managers, brokers can also enjoy the same concessionary tax rate as their um, as, as the lessors and the leasing managers, that is 0%, 0% or 8.25%. So we can see that uh, we already have a very favorable um, tax concessionary uh, regime for the uh, um, uh, different stakeholders in the shipping industry. And this year, the financial secretary mentioned in the budget that um, the government will commence studies on further enhancement on the tax concession for the maritime industry. Um, so the purpose is, of course, to enhance the long term competitiveness of this sector. Uh, so we look forward to the enhancement measures uh, and believe that it should help consolidate Hong Kong's position as an international maritime center. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, enhanced profits tax regime. So the budget proposed to introduce two enhancement measures under the profits tax regime. Um, indeed, these are uh, uh, some measures to uh, fix uh, some current issues of the, our system. The first measure is the tax deduction for uh, reinstatement cost. Uh, uh, actually, when someone leases a property, such as an office, at the end of the lease term, usually they need to reinstate um, the property back to the original condition before handing it back to the landlord. So the expenses that they incurred on the reinstatement are not tax deductible currently because they are capital in nature. And in this project, it is proposed um, to allow a tax deduction for the reinstatement expenses so as to relieve the burden of some uh, of, of the businesses. And subject to the passage of the legislation, the new deduction will take effect from the year of assessment 2024-25. So this is a good news for businesses operating in leased properties as they are generally required to reinstate properties after the lease term. And those usually those reinstatement costs could be significant. So there will be some uh, relief in terms of profit tax uh, in this area. Another measure is related to commercial or industrial building allowances. Um, under the current tax law, when a person purchased a property for commercial or industrial use in carrying on its business, it can claim capital allowances on the cost of construction of the building, what, uh, what we call the commercial building allowance or industrial building, uh, industrial building allowance, 
uh, that is the CBA and IPA in short. Uh, but there is a 25 year time limit for the claim. For example, um, an old build, uh, an old commercial building, which was constructed and in use 25 years ago, that is um, some years before uh, 1998, 99. So when it is sold this year, uh, that is year 2024. And if it is sold this year, according to the current tax law, uh, because it is over 25 years, the buyer would not be entitled to any allowances, but the seller would be subject to a balancing charge. That means it needs to claw back the allowances that it's previously claimed. In other words, um, there is no capital expenditure could be deductible for purchasing an, an, an old commercial or industrial building that had been in use for over 25 years. But this is quite common common um, in, in, uh, in Hong Kong. So the industry had um, uh, previously raised this concern to the government to fix this issue. Um, and in this project, um, uh, the financial secretary proposed to uh, remove the time limits for claiming CBA and IBA uh, with effects from the year of assessment 2024-25. So we are happy that the suggestion has been heard and adopted, and this measure uh, can enhance our profit tax rules and make them more friendly to the taxpayers. And how exactly uh, the new rules will work, uh, we need to wait uh, until the um, government release the uh, draft law. Next slide, please. Um, okay. Update on the timeline for proposed tax regimes. Um, the budget, uh, although did not introduce new tax concessions, uh, it provides a, an update on the timeline of um, these three regimes instead. Uh, first, Pillar 2. Uh, it was announced in last year's budget that Hong Kong will implement the global minimum tax regime and our domestic minimum top up tax starting from year 2025. And the government is now conducting a consultation on the implementation of these proposals. And in the consultation, it is proposed that Hong Kong will introduce the income inclusion rule, IRR, the under tax profits rule, and the Hong Kong minimum top up tax, HKMTT. Uh, for a fiscal year beginning on or after January 1st, 2025. And multinational enterprise groups with an annual consolidated group uh, revenue of at least Euro um, 750 million will be in scope for the Globe Rules and the HKMTT. So in this project, um, the Financial Secretary announced that the government expects to submit a legislative proposal to the Legislative Council in the second half of this year. Next slide, please. Company redomicilation regime. This regime was introduced in last year's budget, and it would enable the foreign companies to redomicile in Hong Kong. Um, the purpose is to provide a legal framework for those enterprises with a business focus in the Asia Pacific region or those offshore companies with management and control in Hong Kong so that they can officially change their uh, place of incorporation as Hong Kong. So this is uh, partly driven by the international tax uh, development, uh, such as economic substance for offshore companies, uh, Pillar 2, and um, uh, the issue of obtaining a certificate of residence, etc. So under the proposed regime, um, a company incorporated outside Hong Kong would be allowed to change its place of incorporation to Hong Kong under the company's ordinance. So it is under the company's ordinance. Okay. Um, there is no economic substance requirements for the redomicilation. And the redomiciled um, company would retain its identity. In other words, there is no new legal entity uh, created through the process. 
so that uh, it would not affect the property rights, obligations and liabilities or any relevant contractual or legal processes of the companies. And upon successful uh, application, the redominance out company will have the same rights and obligations as other companies incorporated in Hong Kong and it would be required to deregister in its original place of incorporation. Uh, from a profit tax perspective, um, this proposed redomicilation regime um, technically should not affect the uh, company's chargeability to Hong Kong profit tax because a person would be um, chargeable to tax for its onshore source income derived from a Hong Kong business. Uh, from business in Hong Kong, um, regardless of its re, uh, dom domicile or place of incorporation. Okay, so um, this is um, basically uh, under our Hong Kong uh, Hong Kong tax law. We look at uh, whether the entity is carrying on business in Hong Kong instead of whether it is a tax resident or whether this is um, incorporated in Hong Kong. So this redomicilation uh, should not uh, affect the, uh, the company's tax obligation to the uh, originating jurisdiction. Uh, and regarding stamp duty implication, uh, as the redomicilation will not entail any transfer or change in the beneficial ownership of the company's asset, so it should not uh, give rise to any stamp duty during the redomicilation. And companies re out to Hong Kong um, should be able to obtain a certificate of residence for tax purpose um, because uh, as long as uh, because the Hong Kong Inner Revenue Department has uh, changed its uh, approach in issuing the COR, uh, they, uh, they said that as long as it can fulfill the um, definition of uh, the Hong Kong tax residence in the tax treaty, it will uh, uh, issue a COR. And in most of the treaties uh, concluded by Hong Kong, Hong Kong residents, uh, tax residents definition uh, will include uh, a company incorporated in Hong Kong. So if a company redomes out to Hong Kong uh, and changes place of incorporation in Hong Kong, uh, we foresee that it is quite straightforward for it to obtain a COR in Hong Kong. And the company redomicilation regime um, was introduced to facilitate overseas companies to redomicile in Hong Kong and uh, promote Hong Kong as a preferred base for multinationals. And the financial secretary announced um, in this budget that um, the legislative proposal will be submitted to the Legislative Council in the first half of um, 2024, that means this year. So. In the upcoming next few months, uh, we look forward to uh, look at the draft law of this uh, regime. Next slide, please. The patent box regime uh, was introduced in last year's budget. Um, as a recap, the proposed regime um, seeks to provide tax concession for profits sourced in Hong Kong, that means onshore sourced um, IP income. Um, that are generated from qualified patents through uh, R&D activities. So uh, in formulating the patent box tax incentive proposal, Hong Kong will generally follow the Nexus approach adopted by the OECD. Uh, specifically, um, the portion of income from an eligible IP asset uh, can qualify, a, qualify for some preferential tax regime. Uh, tax treatment, which is based on the nexus ratio uh, of the, um, uh, the nexus ratio will be uh, a ratio uh, for uh, some expenditure that are spent uh, directly related to the R&D activities um, over the, uh, to the overall expenditures that uh, was incurred by the taxpayer to develop the IP asset. So it is a formula to calculate a ratio. And then if you have that ratio, then that portion of income can qualify for, uh, the, for a concessionary tax rate. And the proposed concessionary tax rate would be 5%. Okay, this was announced uh, in, in the budget as well as the policy addressed earlier this year. 
and the uh, only income derived from an eligible IP asset would be uh, qualified for this uh, tax incentive. And what is eligible IP asset? And it covers patents, copyright software, and plant variety rights. Um, in other words, uh, other other uh, IP intellectual properties that are not covered in these three categories would not be able to enjoy the uh, patent box uh, regime, like uh, the marketing uh, IPs, uh, like the trademark. Uh, then uh, it won't be uh, uh, able to enjoy this uh, uh, patent box regime. And this incentive uh, actually it aims to um, encourage enterprises to devote more resources to R&D in Hong Kong uh, and conduct commercialization transactions by making use of the patents and other ITP protections. And it is announced in this year's budget that the legislative proposal will be introduced to the Legislative Council also in the first half of uh, 2024. Um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so here comes another polling question. Uh, which of the uh, which of the upcoming regimes are you interested in? Um, we have uh, the company redomination regime, the patent box regime, uh, enhanced uh, regime for maritime industry enhanced our uh, regime for single family offices and enhanced regime for fee, uh, fund and carried interest okay um while you are uh while you are uh taking casting your votes um yeah let, let let me ask polly a question uh so polly uh in recent years we can see that uh hong kong took a proactive approach to boost the economic development um by introducing a number of new tax concessions to attract more uh, investment in Hong Kong. So which of the regimes do you think can potentially help most um, to boost Hong Kong's economy? I think the first one is uh, quite relevant to most of my client um, because of this domicilation regime. Uh, some of my clients who was not able to, to satisfy the requirement of Hong Kong IRD to obtain the certificate of resident status, uh, they may able to get it uh, after they were domiciled out of Hong Kong. And it let us it, it let them to enjoy the treaty benefit. Uh, so I think it is quite useful and uh, helpful to most of my clients. Okay, thank you. Um, so let, let me take a look at the, uh, how our participants consider. Okay, I found that um, most of them are, uh, okay, more than, okay, no, number one is our uh, company redomination regime. So that is same as Polly's choice, okay? Congratulations, Polly. <laughs> okay, it's a good choice. So um, the, the other, the second comes to, um, fat, uh, Oh, okay, it's the funds and carried interest. And the third one is the single family offices. So we can see that our uh, asset management uh, in the industry is still very um, attractive to uh, uh, in Hong Kong. Okay, so uh, thank you. So let me pass the stage back to Polly. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, Roy. And this brings us to the end of today's discussion. And we have now some time to answer the questions from our audience. I think some some of the questions these questions mostly re, mostly related to doris part and may may i ask the the help from doris first re, this is a question regarding the redomicilation the question is for hi doris can you help oh yes yeah, sure question is question is uh for the company redomicilation regime if a foreign company changes its place of incorporation to Hong Kong and after the redomicilation, the shares of these companies are transferred, will it be subject to stamp duty in Hong Kong? Oh, well, well, this is a very good question. Um, actually, under the current law for stamp duty, transfer of Hong Kong stock is subject to stamp duty. Um, and Hong Kong stock include the shares of a Hong Kong incorporated company. So if, if the stamp duty law is unchanged, 
um, it is likely that the transfer of the redundant South company shares uh, would be subject to stamp duty. And the stamp duty rate currently is 0.1% on each uh, the buy notes and sold notes. That is a total 0.2%. Um, but but there is a stamp duty relief for intergroup transfer. That means um, if the transferor and the transferee are associated, uh, mean that they are at least uh, ninety percent owned uh, by the same ultimate parent, or they are directly uh, owned each other, then the transfer may be exempt from stamp duty. Yes. Yeah. So in short, um, if there is no change in the stamp duty ordinance, um, we uh, I, I think uh, according to the current law. Uh, once the company has been redormed out to Hong Kong, um, then it uh, should be uh, subject to the stamp duty if its shares are transferred in the future. So let's see uh, how, uh, how, how the government will uh, draft the legislation and see if there will be any change. Okay, very clear. Thank you, Doris. Hi, Roy, are you here? We have a question for you. Yes. This is yes. regarding the regime for carry interest. The question is that for tax concession regime on carry interest, what might be the areas for and for the areas of enhancement? Uh, yeah, th th thank you, Polly. Uh, in fact, this is a, a very good question because uh, in my part, uh, basically, uh, uh, I've been focusing on the uh, enhancement in relation to the uh, fund exemption regime and, and the uh, single family office uh, tax concession regime, right? But uh, not not um, uh, uh, particularly um, uh, speaking on the uh, carry interest regime. So uh, uh, regarding the carry interest regime, first of all, the regime uh, um, uh, has been launched um, um, two, three years ago, so it's pretty new. And um, the ILD has not yet issued uh, uh, its practice notes, uh, the DIPN, regarding the uh, carry interest exemption. So there are certain areas that um, uh, uh, is not uh, totally clear uh, based on our reading of the law. Um, and, um, and that may, may have an impact on the um, uh, application of the, the, the regime right, in, in real cases. So let's, let, uh, for, for instance, um, uh, based on the uh, drafting of, of the um, uh, current legislations, um, basically the um, uh, Hong Kong salaries tax exemptions uh, in relation to carry interest received by a, a, an individual, right, um, uh, working for a, a PE fund house, for example, uh, you know, would be applied only if the carry interest is paid through the Hong Kong uh, entity, uh, which is the employer, right? So, uh, um, so this is how the 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 the, um, the legislation looks like. But um, in reality, uh, we understand that for most of the uh, fund structure, uh, carry that there will be a, a offshore carry interest vehicle, for example, in in Cayman or maybe in BVI. Uh, whereby the um, carry will be paid through those, those vehicles to the individual. So, um, so what is really required under the law in order to get the uh, Hong Kong salaries tax exemption for for carry doesn't really reflect uh, what people are doing in the market, right? So I think this is one of the key areas that um, uh, we are seeking uh, the the Hong Kong government, the ILDs clarifications as to whether they can take a more uh, flexible approach uh, in determining the um, uh, the the uh, the uh, eligibility to the uh, carry interest exemption, uh, in particular for individual. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, that that's basically the the, the key area. Hey, thank you, Rob. We we have quite many questions today, and I need Doris' help again. Uh, this question is about the tax concession uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, the question is: There are a number of tax concession for business in different sectors in Hong Kong. If I want to enjoy the tax concession, do I need to get pre-approval or application or go through any application procedures? How long will it take? Okay, thank you, um, Polly. So for this question, yeah, uh, actually for the preferential tax regimes um, offered by Hong Kong, um, there is no need to obtain pre-approval. Uh, if the taxpayer believes that um, it is eligible to enjoy tax concession, um, it can simply uh, make an election in the annual profit tax return. Um, and uh, when it files its tax return, it also needs to provide the relevant information uh, according to the um, standard supplementary form set by the RLD. 
Uh, then the RD will review the information at, at a later stage. Uh, they may even issue your tax assessment uh, on the assumption that the taxpayer is entitled to the tax concession and review the claim later. And the RD can issue any additional assessment within six years. Uh, alternatively, if a taxpayer uh, wants to get certainty on whether um, it is entitled to uh, the tax transaction before it implements the arrangement, um, it can uh, apply for an advance ruling from the IRD, and usually it takes uh, several months to obtain a ruling. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, this is a question regarding the redomicilation and registration of overseas company. Maybe let me take, let, let me handle this one. The question is, what is the difference between register an overseas company with Hong Kong company registry and the redomicilation to Hong Kong? Uh, I think uh, to me, this is a question to me uh, back to several years ago when our uh, when our chief executive pro uh, introduced this concept. And in fact, uh, as you know, quite many non-Hong Kong incorporated companies, when they carry on business in Hong Kong, they need to register with the CO. Uh, the most common example is, uh, is for, uh, for example, if uh, a company, say Cayman Company, Bermuda Incorporated Company, they want to list in Hong Kong, uh, they need to do the registration with the CO. But it is different from redomicilation. Uh, under the proposed redomicilation, uh, which is still under consultation, this foreign company, the overseas incorporated company, they will move the incorporation place uh, from Bermuda Cayman, uh, wherever it incorporates, to Hong Kong. And the major difference is that uh, according to the uh, most of the tax treaty entered by Hong Kong ILD and other jurisdictions, uh, there is a strict definition of what is the definition of a uh, Hong Kong tax resident. In most of the treaty uh, already entered, it says that either it is a Hong Kong incorporated company, or if you are not incorporated in Hong Kong, and uh, then the central management and control must be carried on in Hong Kong. So what is the, uh, the, the issue is that for some of the uh, uh, listed company in Hong Kong, their uh, senior management or director may not be ordinarily stationed in Hong Kong to oversee the uh, management of the company. And it is quite common for, say, some of the um, PLC uh, company, they go listed in Hong Kong, but the uh, directors, uh, they may only come to Hong Kong to manage the uh, operations of the company several times uh, a year. Under the current, uh, under, under the current uh, practice, the Hong Kong ILD would uh, take a very stringent approach to see uh, whether these uh, non-Hong Kong domicile individual really exercise their uh, control in overseeing and managing uh, the operations of this listed company. So in, certain, in, in some cases, the RLD may not uh, agree to issue the certificate of resident status to this company because they believe that uh, the, this non-Hong Kong uh, individual, non-Hong Kong senior management, they did not come to Hong Kong very often. And as a result, they cannot obtain the certificate of resident status, and then they cannot enjoy the treaty benefit. Uh, this is uh, not not uh, very good. <laughs> it's not very good for some of the client. So this redomicilation regime allow this company to move their, res their their domicile place from the original place of incorporation to Hong Kong can help to uh, to 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 solve this. Uh, issue. So I believe this is one of the most uh, important uh, changes uh, and we look forward to the legislation and see how we can help our client to, 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 to interpret these new rules. And uh, because there are so many questions today and I think <laughs> we need to take, uh, to handle the questions after this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you again, uh, Doris and Roy, and special thanks to all of you who were able to join us today. We would like to encourage you to fill out the short survey that will pop up on your screen and tell us what do you think about today's program. If you join us late, please note that this presentation will be archived for future viewing. 
If you feel that others would benefit from this webcast, please share the webcast via the share this icon or have them visit our debrief website. We will respond to all of the questions submitted during the webcast in a couple of weeks. Also, if you think any other questions or comments later, please feel free to reach out either to me or to our speakers. We'll be more than happy to talk to you. Lastly, from all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in Deloitte's Asia Pacific Test webcast today. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.